This is Billy Kay with the story of the Scots in Hawaii, program three, Pipers and Plant Collectors. I'm in the bustle of Honolulu International Airport which was a lot smaller when my pal Bill and I arrived here from Thailand back in 1975. We had less than $200 between us, no onward tickets, and badly needed a decent visa to work and replenish the funds. As we approach US immigration, we notice that one of the desks is staffed by a young, attractive woman. Bill's always been good at communicating with members of the opposite sex, so he says, that's the cue for me. Meanwhile, I've noticed another desk presided over by a burly male official with the name tag McLeod. This is definitely the cue for me. When Bill engages in eye contact with a woman, she notices his pupils are dilated and calls over male officials who take him away to strip search him for drugs. He's given a three month visa. Meanwhile, I'm regaling Mr. McLeod with a vivid description of Dunvegan Castle and the misty Isle of Skye. The man is awestruck to hear echoes of his ancestral homeland here in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. He grants me a nine-month visa and sends me skipping into the United States. The moral of the story, my fellow countrymen and women, is this. Never rely on fleeting glances and good looks when you have the permanence of the Scottish card to play. The only way you could become a department head at Davies was to be a Scotsman. An awful lot of Scots came over from Scotland right about that time in the late teens and the early 20s. A lot of them were accountants. He got in with some other Scottish accountants here, so it probably it was arranged. The next day he went into the only bank in town, the Bishop Bank, and it was run by Sam Damon, who apparently liked Scots because he hired my father. Samuel Mills Damon, who was a famous banker and politician and Scotophile, actually. He was a Scotophile. He wanted people of Scottish background to run financial affairs, to take accounts, to write records. The Chinese laborers are called coolies. And so the facetious term used for the Scotsman who worked in banks and trust companies in Honolulu was the Scotch coolies. But they liked to hire Scots over here. A number of them had gone to the University of Aberdeen. Plus, they were honest and loyal and faithful. So they were desirable employees. Ian Burney and Dougal Crow on the family members who were part of the financial sector in Honolulu. Not every Scots banker was a paragon of virtue, however, and Elspeth Kerr recalls one who was arrested for serious fraud. They sent him to jail. And there was a period of time when he wasn't the only Scotsman in Oahu prison. And some people waggishly referred to it as Edinburgh Castle. The prison. The prison was Edinburgh Castle. <laughs> the Damon family were hugely influential in bringing so many Scots to Hawaii to work and to marry. Dwight Damon on his grandmother from Troon, Gertrude Valentine Marmakin and Damon, and her love of native Hawaiian culture. She acquired Hawaiian language skills and spoke with the Hawaiians and wrote down special stories and histories from informants, which are almost unique in Hawaiian history, and with an interest in it from the Scottish history, which also shared a kind of sadness. I'm sitting under a spreading banyan tree in the world-famous beach resort of Waikiki, which was where Robert Louis Stevenson stayed in a compound called Sans Souci when he and his family visited in 1889. When I was here in 1975, I stayed near a street named after Stevenson with his Polynesian title of Tusitala, Teller of Tales. But a hundred years before Stevenson, the first Westerner to describe Waikiki to the outside world was another Scot, the botanist and surgeon from Aberfeldy, Archibald Minges. The shore was planted with a large grove of coconut palms, affording a delightful shade. The plantation laid out with great neatness into little fields planted with taro, yams, sweet potatoes and cloth plant. Minges was just one of many distinguished Scots plant collectors to contribute to our knowledge of the flora and fauna of these beautiful islands. 
Mingus was there and he started exploring as a man of the Enlightenment would do. He was a doctor and he was a botanist and he was charged with collecting specimens on behalf of Joseph Banks, who himself had been there with Cook. On the big island of Hawaii, there are two peaks, Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea, which at that time were reckoned to be amongst the highest mountains of the world. And Mingus determined to climb them. He certainly was the first to climb Mauna Loa. The first European, we can't say for certain that he was the first person to climb them, although there's a good chance he was because the Hawaiians considered it the home of the gods and it was taboo to go there. When David Douglas visited the area 40 years later, he heard stories of the Caledonian surgeon and plant-collecting pioneer who had gone before him. They called him the man with the red hair who cut off the limbs of men. So clearly he was a surgeon. He obviously had red hair, being a good Scot. They obviously nicknamed him that on that basis. Some of them really liked the idea of planting something in the ground and watching it grow and then trying to fool around with its properties a little bit to see if it could be made more productive. And it seems that there was a lot of that going on in the early years, the development of the sugar industry and later on pineapple and macadamia and all these other agricultural industries. There was a lot of experimentation being done on the plantations and small farms and a lot of it was being done by Scots. One is William Herbert Purvis and he was born in Cameron Fife in 1858. He ended up moving to Hawaii with his father. He was only 19 years old so he came to Hawaii in about 1878, and he became manager of the Pacific Sugar Mill. But he was very interested in plants, and so he was the one that introduced the macadamia nut trees to Hawaii, the very first one. As the sugar industry has waned, the macadamia nut has become more prominent in Hawaii. Another of our plant collectors, James McCree, was almost overwhelmed by the abundance of life in these islands, including metrosideros with red, bunchy flowering tops covered with many red birds sucking honey from the blossoms. Donald McIntyre, a fine, fine horticulturist. He was also an expert in orchids. He then went on round-the-world journeys, including India, Cambodia, and other places, to find exotic fruits like mango, and he brought in the finest mangoes of the time, and he brought the Alphonse mango. In addition to that, he brought in a variety of bananas, figs. He is called also the Dean of Landscape Gardening in Hawaii because he really knew how to lay something out, and my ancestor was fully backing him. So what did he end up doing? He ended up making the first golf course west of the Rocky Mountains. He made an 18-hole golf course in Mwanalua. Was it one of the first golf courses in Hawaii then? It was the first golf course. So many of Hawaii's lush botanical gardens too were begun by Scots. Momi Norton and Barbara Moy are there on just a few. One of our greatest plant collectors, David Douglas, is still mourned in Hawaii where he died in a tragic accident or was murdered by an ex-convict from Australia. Sid House is the author of a book on Douglas. Plant hunters at that stage in the early part of the 19th century, average life expectancy for those commissioned by Q or the Royal Horticultural Society was about a year. But Douglas would go off on adventures of his own. Having passed by a lake of liquid fire boiling with furious agitation on January 28th, 1834, Douglas and his pet terrier Billy began the climb to the summit of the Mauna Loa volcano. Reaching the crater on the 29th, he wrote, how insignificant are the works of man in their greatest magnitude and perfection compared with such a place. Here, man feels himself as nothing, as if standing on the verge of another world. A nail had gone through his knee. He used to suffer from severe inflammation of that knee. This is a man used to walking 20 to 30 miles a day. He also had snow blindness to the extent that his eyes would become so bloodshot it almost felt as there was blood coming out of his eyes. Despising the scorching heat and pain in my feet, the skin also peeling off my face, while on the summit I experienced violent headache, my eyes becoming bloodshot accompanied by stiffness in their lids. If you've just seen the Hollywood movie with The Revenant with Leonardo DiCaprio, you might get a feeling of just what that sort of adventure was like. Some of those who met him in Hawaii thought that he had lost his mind at some time. 
but he certainly appeared to be acting strangely to those there. Douglas's end was as dramatic as the rest of his life. At the age of 35, botanising and studying the active volcanoes of Hawaii, he fell into a bull pit and was gored to death. Did he genuinely die as a result of an accident, falling into a pit? So that was the one theory that he was gored to death. And the other theory was he was pushed, robbed, and that Ned Gurney himself was most likely the villain. I'm now sitting by the monument to David Douglas, a Scottish cairn, put here in 1934. And it's on the slopes, the verdant slopes in this part of the great volcano of Mauna Kea. And it says on it the words Kalua Kauka, which is the Hawaiian for the doctor's pit. And it says, in memory of Dr. David Douglas, killed near this spot in a wild bullock pit, July 12th, 1834 AD. This tablet erected 1934 by the Hilo Burns Club. The Burns Club also planted 200 magnificent Douglas firs here, which form a peaceful grove around the monument. In 1942, a visitor described the scene in the Journal of American Forests. Quite a number of lovely evergreen trees have been planted inside the wall, in memory of the good and great man whose name they bear. By the early decades of the 20th century, there was a substantial community of Scots in Honolulu, Doug Philpott and Isabel Lamb Ryan. It was a community. My parents' friends were all Scottish. They didn't socialize with anybody else but Scottish people. And all they had a big circle of Scottish friends that they entertained and they were very, very friendly. We all called them aunt and uncle. And there was a lot of them here. And some of them had really big jobs. I mean, you know, like George Hogg, who was president of Hawaiian Electric, and Guild, who was president of Hawaiian Telephone Company. I do remember an occasional Hogg Monet party at our house. And that was Scots only. <laughs> Very happy occasions. We had a piano my mother could play. We had a big, fat booklet, the Scottish Students Songbook, and she would play, and they would gather around and sing whatever they knew. My father had a complete collection of Harry Lauder. He came to Honolulu on more than one occasion. The first time he came, my brother was little, he was blonde, and he had a head of curly hair, and they went down to the ship to meet him as he came off, and Harry Lauder said, this laddie has a head like a wee heelin bull. <laughs> and then, subsequently, they came to our house for tea, and he wrote a song, I Love You, Honolulu. I love you, Honolulu. It's very cute. <laughs> some spoke what we would term American English, and, and some never got around to it. <laughs> His good friend lived through the block from us, Jimmy McLean, and he had been in World War I and been gassed by the Germans. And, he set up a bar in his yard. He had a big signboard above the bar saying, Here's Tess, was like us daily in. Oh, well, yeah, Lang me your lum reek. Ach, well, that was his favorite. Now, he had such a broad accent coming from up four fur way. I could hardly understand him. It was almost like he spoke Gaelic. They used it, stop your greeting. The other thing he used to say about her is a phrase she always used. You need to give more than you talk out of life. These are wise words. Oh, indeed, and she was, a, she was a wise woman. When I was in Oahu back in 1975, initially I slept on Sunset Beach on the North Shore and collected puka shells left behind by the pounding surf. Puka shell necklaces were a beach fashion item then, selling for around $15. Mine had extra cachet, though, due to the unique marketing strategy proclaimed on a handmade sign which read, Genuine Hawaiian puka shell necklaces made by Scottish craftsmen. The necklaces sold well, and the sign led to some amazing introductions. One to a paid gig as a drummer in a pipe band.
We're sort of the next generation of the Aggie Wallace pipers here. She's considered the grand dame of piping in Hawaii. It was a thing to do for any piper to be able to say they took lessons from Aggie Wallace. So I became one of those. So weekly, uh, faithfully, I'd sit in her kitchen with my practice chatter, and she'd beat time. And just like with younger students, if you missed a beat, you'd get that lead pencil right across your knuckles. When I visited Aggie for the first time, I chapped in her door in Waikiki, and she shouted out, come a in. She was in her 70s, a big woman, covered from neck to toe in a Wallace Tartan Mother Hubbard. She was from Colsaith and in her younger days had toured the American vaudeville circuit, playing the pipes for a troupe of nubile, mini-kilted female dancers. In 1938, she came here to Hawaii, playing, starting a pipe band and teaching the pipes, and she's still vividly remembered. I wasn't supposed to be taking lessons, but I swiped my brother's practice channel and taught myself Scots Wahave, sort of in secret. <laughs> and then when I played it, my parents said that I could have lessons from Aggie. I started when I was nine. What was she like as a teacher? Oh, she was fabulous. She was just the most amazing person. She was like entering a magical fairyland when you went to her house because she knew clowns and she knew people in vaudeville and she... I have a picture of her that she gave to me of her riding an elephant with a big feather headdress on. She was just magical. So to me, music was always, you know, as a small child, was related to this sort of magical ability to create your own world, and she was just amazing. My grandma put makeup on the star's face, so she used to put makeup on Joan Crawford. So that's how she knew Lana Turner and Joan Crawford and Grace Kelly and all of those old actresses, because she used to put makeup on them. <laughs> oh, really? The Celtic pipes and drums of Hawaii, playing at the annual Hawaiian Scottish Festival. Aggie's granddaughters Leanne Davis and Heather Ross and their piping disciples Dan Quinn, Larry Coleman and Kim Greeley. Aggie was also one of the first to adapt Hawaiian music for the pipes. From her, I got the admonition always. I can always hear her talking to me now. It's like, where's the heart in the music? What are you playing? That was always every lesson. Where's the heart? I don't hear it yet. It was from Aggie that I got the key to my music. She said, you have to find the heart in the music. She played even on her front yard <laughs> in Kaimaki. She would entertain the kids in the neighborhood. She was a real Scottish, like you see in Braveheart. <laughs> so my dad always tell the story about our grand ancestor, who is Sir William Wallace, and how such a hero he became. And she's my hero. The only reason I've ever gone to Scotland was because of Aggie. So in the middle of the Pacific, I found this amazing woman who knew everybody in the piping world. Yeah. Do you love her? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she is one of the biggest people in my life. At the Games, I also spoke to a group of Highland dancers who travelled all the way from Helensborough, pupil Isla Charlton and teacher Margaret McInnes. Well, the whole trip's memorable from yes. start to finish because we go and we dance in an old folks' home when we're here so that we're giving something back to the community in Hawaii. And we met a lady who... She was Scottish and very old. And I don't think she would ever have thought in her wildest dreams she'd see Highland dancers. Is this your first time to Hawaii? Um, no, I came to Hawaii last year as well. What's your impression so far of being here? Well, the weather is like really nice and it's a really nice opportunity. It's not every day that you see or hear people like saying, oh yeah, I went to Hawaii. <laughs> it's it's quite tiring sometimes, and that the events are really good because we've danced at the Tartan Day Festival. And they danced on the TV to promote the Highland Games. So that was very exciting wow. for them. And then they danced at the memorial for Princess Kailani. No No Hawaii, Nui, Akea, Aina, Kamaha, Okui, Kamoana. 
traditional Hawaiian chanting by Tiwila Tala Esi from the annual tribute to our Scots Hawaiian princess, Kaiolani. On the Isle of Maui, artist Hamish Burgess hosts a Celtic radio show and was one of the prime movers in the creation of the Hawaii tartan. He describes its colours. A mid-blue for the ocean and the sky, the green is for the foliage, the red-brown muted stripe in the middle is for the specific dirt colour that we have here in Hawaii, and the red and yellow are for two reasons. One, the fire and lava that created the islands, and also it's the colours of the elite or the royalty in Hawaii. Also on Maui, at his beachside home, I spoke to Alec McBarnett about his mother, who was steeped both in the genealogy of her Scottish family forebears and in the Hawaiian culture of the island. She danced hula from the time she was 16 with the Beamers, which are you know, a family that today are held in some high esteem. But then she also surfed with the Kanamokus as a kid, you know, in Queen Surf. You know, it's really her fabric on these islands. She's part of these islands. Then at 75, she decides that she's going to be a genealogist. She flies up to Stirling, where she goes for 10 years. She goes to classes, and, but then she jumps on those postal vans and goes to every church and every place to be able to validate that list that you've been looking at. So her story of perseverance and live for today is incredible. We're sitting here on a veranda with a beautiful aquamarine colored ocean out past the beach here and windsurfers on it and the sound of the surf and palm trees in the garden. It's a long way from Scotland. It is, but it's open territory, isn't it? It's the open space. I love the mountains and I love the hills and the rolling hills. So that's what this is. It gives you a sense of elbow room, of freedom, of clean air, but of standing alone, of independence. Talking of thrown independence, although there had been a Burns Club on the Big Island and a Thistle Club in Honolulu Lang Syne, it wasn't till the 60s that a modern Scottish society got going. And now there are several. Lillian Cunningham of the Scottish Country Dance Society, Brenda Ritchell of the St Andrew Society and Heather McGregor on her dad organising the Caledonian Society in 1965. He went to each island and found whatever Scots he could, and there were quite a few more then, born and raised in Scotland. And they all got together, decided they were going to form a society. Most of the members then were Scottish-born. So there was a good deal more knowledge about Scotland. However, now, most of the people are people who have an interest in Scotland but really know very little about it. They've come to the society to learn about Granny's country. We were brought together to help other people learn more about Scotland. And we also have a Scottish society that we're trying to put out a scholarship is what we're also formulating. But it's also about fun and about different educational events, and we get involved in the, the Highland Games. We actually like to get a little bit more dressed up than some of the others sometimes. <laughs> but we have a lot of good times learning about the different cultural aspects of Scottish history that is here in Hawaii, too. So we have survived. We've printed a book, Scots in Hawaii, and we have a easily thousand book library and videos and movies and so forth. So do you still go along to the Bottom oh, Supper? Yeah. Listen, I was the Scot of the Year two years ago. Oh, good. <laughs> what did you do to get that? Nothing. I mean, I got named. No, I heard it was a close vote. <laughs> We're now thinking about possibly having a Celtic cultural center. So that's our next focus. Despite the vast distances involved, it's remarkable how many Scots Hawaiians regularly come home. Bud Clark to his University City of Glasgow and Epi Kerr to our family city of Edinburgh. Each time I go back, I always start in Edinburgh and I always feel so at home there, it's as if I'm coming home. It's such a beautiful place, especially in, say, late May when the lilacs are out and they match the gray stone. It's just, it's a magic place. There's a sense of community and bonding that the two communities share. A love for good times. You know, in Hawaii, people naturally are 
inclined to dance and to sing and for merriment, right? And well, Glasgow, it's uh, perhaps one of the epicenters of that in the world. So I, I see those connections back and forth in terms of community and the people. Another factor linking contemporary Hawaii and Scotland is the question of our constitutional status. Dr. Keanu Sai. What America did was in 1898, they passed the joint resolution on July 6, 1898, at the height of the Spanish-American War, to annex Hawaii. Now, a joint resolution is a U.S. law. A U.S. law is limited to U.S. territory. So the United States could no more annex Hawaii by passing a law in 1898 than the United States could annex Scotland by passing a law today. With the referendum that just took place, there's a lot of people here watching that quite closely. And I think the shakers and movers in that sovereignty movement are being very thoughtful and they're watching internationally how this is unfolding for other countries. And I wouldn't be surprised if in my lifetime we see this come up on the ballot here. I hope you've enjoyed our trip to these magical islands. I'll leave you with the voices of a piper, Alan Miyamura, and of Scots Hawaiians for whom the blood is strong, but perhaps the heart is even stronger. The legacy of freedom represented by Burns, I mean, they certainly were proud of him and proud of their names and their families. I used to relish and tell everybody I was a thoroughbred because here in the islands, nobody's a thoroughbred. <laughs> Everybody's mixed up chop suey. <laughs> I'm 100 proof. The legacy in Hawaii, I think, is that Scots are a wonderful, kind, nice people, aren't you? <laughs> and so they're just wonderful people. And not only that, they hardly have any prejudices, to be honest with you. You know, I read about the Jews, and the Jews never got persecuted in Scotland. And you know, they're just a wonderful people, and God bless them. I think that Scots have integrity, and if you don't have integrity, you have nothing. That's what I'm kind of proud about. The Scottish people have put together the toughest, strongest cultural history and gift to the world that I've seen. The only Scottish connection I have is with my name, Alan. <laughs> you know? But as far as being Scottish, I'm not of Scottish origin, I'm you know Japanese, yeah. but I truly believe that being Scottish is not necessarily a matter of blood, but a matter of the heart.